I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come, right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness, right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Well, little Miss Honey, how are you today? Warm. How are you? Hot. I'm sorry. I wish I could do something about it. Well, the only thing you can do with the weather is to live with it. Well, I think I could live with it easier if you'd please read the funnies to me. Puck the Comic Weekly? Yes. Very well, I will, in just a moment. But first, here's that nice man with something interesting to say. Oh, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And at the top of the first page... Snookums, snookums, snookums. Well, since you're excited about that, we'll read Snookums, snookums, snookums. Magic, wait for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Diddly-da, diddly-do, wake a mack Let's have a little tune for little snookums. <laughs> Rosie tells Archie that Snookums isn't in the house. And she wonders if Snookums might be lost. Archie says... Oh, gosh, my baby... I'll go look for him right away. And by the time you can say, come out, come out, wherever you are, Archie's running off down the street yelling, Snookums! Snookums! Can you hear me? Answer, Daddy! Snookums! Last picture, top row, he finds two men, and one says, Hey, what's the matter, pal? Lose something? Archie answers excitedly, well, My baby is lost. Will you help me look for him? So the men join the hunt. First picture, next row. A dozen men, including the policeman in the corner, are helping Archie look for Snookums. Archie yells, Snookums, where are you? Just around the corner, little Snookums is toddling along. A little boy runs past, and Snookums asks, What is everybody looking for? And the little boy answers, A little boy's lost. Just then, Archie comes around the corner. He sees Snookums and exclaims, <laughs> Snookums, there you are. And Snookums answers, Yes. Snookum's helping to look for a lost boy. And Archie goes. <laughs> Wasn't that funny? <laughs> yeah, Wasn't that a funny look on Archie's face? <laughs> I think I'd look like that, too, if I learned someone I was looking for was looking for himself without knowing who it was he was looking for. <laughs> yes, I would, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, now what? Oh, oh, now, would you please turn over the page and read Flash Gordon? Because that bad man, Zinn, has captured Flash. And now, Fla and now Zinn is going to have Flash put into the smoke chamber. And when Flash breathes the smoke, he will no longer be able to think for himself. And Zinn will be able to make Flash do anything he wants him to do. Yes. So let's learn now how Zinn's plans work out. So here we go over to page two with Flash Gordon. rega dig a doon doon Saskimatash. Let's have music for Heroic Flash. <laughs> Flash, crushed by the false report of Dale's death, is marched toward the liquid and gas chamber. Zinn sneers. When you come out, you'll be an automaton, blindly obedient to my orders. <laughs> Rubia hurries down to bid Flash farewell. She tells him again that Dale is dead, which is not true, and she says that she loves him too much to have him become a zombie. And then she hands him a little gadget to put in his nose, saying that if he breathes through these filters, the smoke will not affect him. To save himself from becoming Zinn's slave, Flash accepts Rubia's help. And last picture top row, he is herded into the atomic gas chamber with a group of Zinn's men, all doomed to a living death. The door closes, and the gas is turned on in the chamber. First picture next row, Flash watches the others carefully. He sees a tragic change come over the men as they breathe the subtly poisonous fumes. Flash studies their actions. He must imitate them exactly or risk some new cruelty by Zinn. Then he puts the filters in his nose and pretends to inhale the gas. And as he does, he wonders whether the filters will really save him from the fate that has fallen on the other men. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
A little later, the men, now newly made automatons, men who walk like little dolls that are wound up, march out of the gas chamber. They are taken outside, last picture, where Zinn and Rubia are waiting in Zinn's armored car. Zinn beckons to Flash and commands his new slave. Flash, march behind me. The car slowly drives off. Flash tries to copy the rigid mechanical walk of the zombies as he follows Zinn's car. Rubia stares at him fearfully, not sure whether he's really man or machine. Oh, oh, I hope that those filters that Flash put in his nose worked. Do you think that they did? Well, I certainly hope so. And next week, I'm sure we should find out whether they did or not. And then, then we'll find out what Zinn's going to try to make Flash do. Yes. Oh, I can hardly wait. This is getting so exciting. Well, sometimes we have to wait for the most exciting things. Yes, isn't that awful? Uh-huh. But look across the page. Oh, yes, Dick's Adventures. And something exciting is going to happen there, too, because last week Dick, who was with Paul Revere in the early days of America, came back from a secret meeting with a lot of men, and he has some plan, and I'm anxious to find out. Yes, the English are trying to make the Americans buy tea that is very highly taxed. That means it costs more than it should, and that isn't fair. No, it is not fair, and the Americans don't want to buy the tea. So let's try to find out now what this mysterious plan is. Oh, great. So here we go with Dick's Adventures. Say the magic words with me. rickety pack kazak kazik Let's have, have music for Adventurous Dick. Dick. and Paul Revere's home again. Dinner is being served. As Paul and Dick begin to eat, last picture top row, Paul says to his wife, It's a lovely dinner, my sweet, but where's the tea? Pray fetch the tea. Dick looks up in surprise because he thought that the Americans had agreed not to buy the tea from the English, and by refusing to buy it, forced the English to take off the high tax. Dick exclaims, Tea? Paul's wife is just as surprised. And she tells him first picture next row that she can't understand men. That Paul has told her time and time again to have no tea in the house at all while the tax is on it. Paul smiles and says, Tonight we want the king's tea, eh, Dick? He gets up, puts on his hat and coat, followed by Dick. And Paul says grimly, We'll settle this matter of tea at the Green Dragon. Come. <laughs> Last picture of the row, Paul and Dick are seated at a table in the corner of the Green Dragon Inn, a favorite gathering place of the men of Boston. In the Green Dragon Inn, no tea is tasted, but it is not neglected. To the table of Dick and Paul, one by one, the men of Boston come. As they stop at the table, instructions are given to each of them, and the instructions are always the same. Finally, the last man approaches the table, first picture bottom row, and Dick whispers to him, Tea party tonight, Ben, at Griffin's Wharf. Indians only. Coming? And the man named Ben replies, I'll be there with a tomahawk. Leaving the Green Dragon, Dick and Paul Revere return home once more to carry out the next step in their plan. A short time later, last picture, two Mohawk braves carrying tomahawks and wearing the full dress of Indians slip noiselessly from Paul Revere's house. A man standing in the shadow across the street watches silently as the two Indians come out of the house where Paul Revere lives. A grim look settles over his face. Why do you suppose they've dressed up like Indians again? Well, now they're on their way to carry out the plan that the men have agreed on. Who is that man that sees them? The one with the grim look on his face. I'm afraid all of this is something we'll have to wait until next week to find out. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Always wait, wait, wait. Oh, but the good things are worth waiting for. Yes, I know. So I'll wait. I'll wait. Goody. And just for that, I'll read Rusty Riley for you. Here he is, right underneath Dick's adventures. Oh, oh I'm so anxious to see what's going to happen to that sneaky Taffy Allardyce, who's Mr. Miles' nephew, because Tex knows that Taffy put the dope in Hillbilly's feet and it made him sick. Yes, Tex has discovered enough of what's going on to suspect Taffy, and he's speaking to Mr. Miles about his suspicions. So quick, Reed, let's find out what happens. Very well. Here we go with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. <laughs> Mr. 
Mr. Miles has just heard Tex's suspicions of what's going on, and he exclaims, Tex, I find it very difficult to believe my nephew, Allardyce, would be guilty of giving poisonous food to a horse. Tex replies, Okay, boss, I can't prove it, but sure as shooting, somebody's after Big Blaze. Why, if Blaze had been in his own stall, he'd have got that dose instead of Hillbilly. It's only a week till a Selby Cup. Hey, couldn't we take Blaze to the track now? Mr. Miles thinks for a second and then replies, uh, I'll speak to Colonel Adams, the owner of Cedar Point Track. Tex reaches for his hat, saying, That's plum good sense, boys. I'll go along, and by jingles, I'll sleep in Big Blaze's stall if need be. Mr. Miles finds Colonel Adams, owner of Cedar Point Track, near a huge tree. He walks up to him and says, Oh, excuse me, Colonel. May I have a word with you? It's uh, about my Selby Cup entry, Big Blaze. Colonel Adams replies, Why, of course, Quentin. Goldie, who is Taffy Allardyce's wife, sees the two men talking. Quietly, she slips over behind the tree to hear what's being said. <coughs> Last picture top row, she overhears Mr. Miles say, I wonder if you could let me have quarters for Blaze at the track a little ahead of time. I'd like to send him over tomorrow morning. Colonel Adams replies, Why, certainly, certainly. You may have number four and row B. <laughs> Hearing this, Goldie quietly slips away without being seen. And the plan which Tex wanted to keep secret is known now by the very person who was scheming to bring trouble into Rusty's life. A little later, as Rusty is playing with the hunting dogs, Tex tells him first picture bottom row, Uh, Rusty, the boss wants you to clean up and come to the house. He wants you to help with the wraps and things at the dinner party. Rusty replies, Oh, sure, Tex, as soon as I put these dogs in the run. That night, after all of the guests have arrived for the party, Rusty has a few minutes to himself. He sits in a big chair in front of the fireplace, saying to himself, I guess all the people are here now. I think I'll just curl up in this big chair till it's time for him to leave. Suddenly, he hears voices behind him. He recognizes them as Goldie and Taffy Allardyce, the two schemers. They don't see Rusty in the chair. Rusty overhears Goldie tell Taffy that Big Blaze is going to be taken to the Cedar Point track tomorrow morning. Rusty hears Taffy exclaim last picture. Good night. That settles it. I'll have to finish him off tonight, somehow. Rusty's eyes open in horror at these words, and he knows he must move quickly if Blaze is to be saved. Ooh, I just hope they don't see Rusty there, because if they know that he heard them, they may do something terrible to him. Kidnapping, maybe. Well, let's hope not. Well, I just hope that Mr. Miles learns that his nephew's really a bad old mean person and time for him to do something about well, it. Well, next week we'll find that out, I'm sure. That is, if you'll be here. Oh, I wouldn't miss it. Fine. And now would you like to miss Donald Duck? Oh, I should say not. Donald Duck is one of my favorite favorites. Well, then turn over the page. And there he is right at the top. And I'll read Donald in a minute. But first, here's that nice man with something interesting to say. <laughs> Now, here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on top of page four, Donald Duck. Say the magic words with me. Squeeze them, squeeze them, squid a chicka chack. Let's have music, spin a quack quack. Donald passes a nursery, which is a place where they sell flowers and plants. He sees an ivy plant on the table and a sign which reads... Climbing Ivy, 50 cents. <laughs> Donald exclaimed, Just what I need for my porch. And next picture, he has planted the ivy beside his porch, aiming it so it'll climb up the porch post. And he says, There. Now in a few weeks, it'll cover the porch. <laughs> Two weeks later, Donald takes a look at his ivy plant and sees that instead of climbing up the post, it has fallen over backwards, flat on the ground. And Donald exclaims, Huh, 
That's funny. So he straightens the ivy up and ties the ivy to the post. And then says, there, now she'll climb. Two weeks later, last picture top row, Donald takes another look at his ivy. He finds that it's grown twice as much, but instead of climbing up the post, it has fallen over backwards again and climbed right down to the ground. And by the time you can go... Donald is back at the nursery, first picture, bottom row, with a plant, and he says to the man he bought it from, Look, pal, you sure this stuff is climbing, Ivy? I, uh, quite sure. What's your trouble? I wanted to climb my porch, and it won't climb. Well, that's easy, sir. You need a trellis. So the man points out a trellis, which is some pieces of wood put together sort of like a ladder. And the man says, Now here's a nice one, only five dollars. So Donald decides the ivy will surely climb up that because it has something to hang on to. And he exclaims, I'll take it. And by the time you can say, shinny up my trellis, Mr. Ellis, Donald has planted the ivy beside his porch again and winds it around the trellis to give it a good start so it'll climb up and then waits happily for it to grow. One month later, last picture, Donald takes a look at his ivy and he's amazed to see that instead of climbing up the trellis, the ivy has crawled right through it at the bottom and then up the porch that Donald tried to make it climb in the first place. And Donald exclaims, What? <laughs> oh, poor Donald. Everything goes wrong for him. Yes, no wonder he's annoyed after paying $5 for a trellis which the ivy doesn't want to climb. Yes, but I just love Donald Duck because he's so funny. <laughs> oh, look, look, right underneath Donald Duck. Oh. Oh, it's Roy Rogers, my favorite cowboy. Mine, too. I'm anxious to have you read that because just as we left Roy last week, he was trying to find out who set fire to the prairie and all the telegraph poles. And while Roy was looking at some strange footprints, his friend, Brad, went behind some rocks and then shouted for help. So please, quick read so we can find out what's the trouble. Very well. Here we go with Roy Rogers, king of the cowboys. hi yip hi Now here we go with Roy and Trigger. hi yip hi <laughs> Roy and IQ Theorem run to answer Brad's call for help. Brad yells, Help! My eye! Something blinded me! Roy runs up and asks, Well, what was it, Brad? Brad, holding his hands over his eyes, replies, I spotted some pole timber, and then I walked out of the narrow pass, and a flash of light hit me. Roy exclaims, Well, that's just what happened to that blinded cow poke I found up here. Just then it begins to rain. Roy helps Brad under a ledge of rock, saying, Yeah, sit under the ledge here, Brad. I'm going back up there. And Roy turns and walks off, saying, Reckon it's my turn to see what's on the other side of that unlucky pass. IQ Theorem, the investigator from the city, warns, Careful, Rogers. If you get blinded, how will we get back to camp? Roy replies, Well, don't worry. Trigger knows the way. And as he walks between the rocks, last picture, top row, he thinks to himself, Hey, this rain will sure wash out those funny sandal tracks we spotted back on the trail. First picture, bottom row, Roy stops suddenly and exclaims, Looks like something's moving up there in that ridge. And I can't see much in this rain. Roy isn't wrong. For behind the boulder, before the cave, the old hermit is watching. And he exclaims, Yeah, I thought I scared off those telegraph fellers when I blinded that big one. But there's another one coming up. He trots in the cave after his rifle, saying, I can't blind this fella because it's raining. But I can shoot him. A snooping varmint. And he trots back again, carefully watches Roy and exclaims, <laughs> I ain't letting nobody snoop around trying to find out what starts all the fires in the valley. Roy steps out from behind a rock and starts to move up the hill. Suddenly, a bullet goes through Roy's hat. Roy exclaims last picture. Wow, that was too close. And the old hermit exclaims, Missed, blast it. But next time, I won't. Oh, my. I hope Roy gets behind the rocks fast, because next time, maybe that hermit won't miss. 
No, that hermit is up there in the cave, and it'd be pretty hard to get at him. I can hardly wait to see if they will capture him. Well, we'll find out next week. Oh, I certainly hope so. Now I think it's time for... Dagwood and Blondie, I hope. You're absolutely (laughs) right. So if you'll pick up the first page of the second section of Puck the Comic Weekly, we'll read Dagwood and Blondie. Ramafoo, ramafum, zim, zam, zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. Dagwood, who's at his office, is talking to the bookkeeper named Eddie, a tall, skinny, worried-looking fellow. Eddie says, I'm terribly nervous lately. Dagwood replies, You know, you ought to get married, Eddie. Eddie holds out his hand and exclaims, Here, look. See how my hand shakes. (laughs) Dagwood replies, "Ah, You look like you're waving at someone. You know... You need a little wife to take care of you. Last picture, top row, Eddie takes a medicine and swallows it. <laughs> and he exclaims, I, I jump when the phone rings. Dagwood says, Eddie, you need peace and contentment. The bitter patter of tiny feet around your house. First picture, next row, Eddie says thoughtfully, You're winning me over, Dagwood. Dagwood gives him a pat on the back, saying, Come home to dinner with me tonight and see for yourself how serene and blissful married life can be. Eddie replies, uh, yeah, All right, I'll call up the boys and tell them I'm not going out with them tonight. <laughs> and it's decided that Eddie is to come home with Dagwood for dinner. <laughs> Meanwhile, someone's been playing tricks on Blondie. The doorbell is rung, and when she answers it, there's no one there. <laughs> Cookie tells Blondie, first picture, next row, that it's the new kids up the street who ring doorbells and then run. And that gives Blondie an idea. Well, at this moment, Dagwood is on the way home with his friend, Eddie. And he points out all the people in the neighborhood who are mowing lawns, clipping hedges, and enjoying life. Dagwood says, Look at all these happy, contented husbands, Eddie. Eddie replies mournfully, Yeah, I'm beginning to realize all I've missed by being single. Then they ring Dagwood's doorbell, last picture of the row. And Dagwood says, The peace and joy of married life is all you need, Eddie. And first picture, bottom row, the door opens, and three horrible-looking people jump at them, yelling, (laughs) And Eddie disappears down the street like a shot. (laughs) As Dagwood, who has fallen over on his back, looks up dazed, Blondie sticks her head out from under a sheet and says, We were trying to scare some fresh little kids who were ringing our doorbell. And Alexander exclaims, Yeah, your friend ran away, Pop. Dagwood shakes his head, wondering what has happened to him. (laughs) Meanwhile, last picture down at the pool hall, Eddie rushes in and says to his friends, (laughs) Don't let me get married, (laughs) boy. Yes. <laughs> After all of Dagwood's talk, Blondie's little game changed Eddie's mind about getting married. <laughs> Isn't that silly? Because dressing up like ghosts is lots of fun. Yes, Eddie should try it sometime. Yes, he should. Well, now it's time for Prince Valiant. Oh, goody. So go past the Comic Weekly Club, which I hope you look at when we get through. Oh, I certainly will, because I just love the puzzles and games in the Comic Weekly Club. And then go past Buzz Sawyer and the Phantom over to the last page, and there he is, Prince Valiant in the days of King Arthur. Hackett, Brackett, Dray Malkin, and Quince. Music romantic for a fair, fair prince. King Hap Atla couldn't capture King Agwar's castle, so the two kings are now having a peace conference. Alita had come in and told the men to stop their arguing and decide never to have war again so that the women and the children could enjoy life safely and peacefully. Then Alita left the conference. All she wanted was a healthy, happy place in which to bring up her baby. And her quiet words were like a whiplash that stripped away their arrogance. King Agua conceals a smile. He knows his enemies are blustering because they think his defenses are weak. Alita's words have shown them how desperate is their position. By this time, last picture top row, Cap Atla's wife, Queen Jan, is now completely under Alita's spell and readily agrees when Alita asks her to go into the castle and see her new gowns. So they leave the children with the men, and the two women go toward the castle. First picture, next row. Hap Atta looks up in time to see them entering the castle. He leaps to his feet and shouts, Treachery! 
Queen Zan has been taken prisoner. King Agua chuckles. I'll be hostage for her safe return. But if you have sufficient foolhardy courage to meddle in women's affairs, you may take my seal ring and follow. So, last picture of the row. Under the protection of the ring, Hapatla enters the stronghold he could not invade by force. Once inside, first picture bottom row, he has a chance to notice that, though not a soldier is to be seen, the war machines are well-oiled, stacks of weapons abound, and the rustle and murmur of many men can be heard. And then, last picture, he is led to the Lady Alita's apartment, into which he bursts angrily, and then stops. There's an instant of embarrassed silence, because he finds his wife trying on one of Alita's nice gowns. And the women are very angry that even he, a king, should come to their room. And believe me, thereafter he wishes he had paid more heed to King Agwa's warning to leave the women alone. Well, it certainly serves him right. If he will just keep his nose out of things, these women will settle everything in a nice, peaceful way. Yes, so far I think Alita has proven that she's right. Yes, she has. And I hope he's learned his lesson. Well, next week we'll find out. Now, that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that nice man with something interesting to say. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I've got to go now. All right, Mr. Cummy Weezy Man, but I'll be waiting for you next. Okay, that's a date, and a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. (laughs) 